Wealth Attraction Research War. The pilot, inspired by my website, exercisingyourmind.com, which is Wealth Attraction Research. Uh, great health is the truest of all wealth. This is the pilot episode here on Wisdom Social Audio Inc. And if all works out well, it will be on Spreaker as well, social podcasting. I'm going to be going through various different books. You can always check out articles on exercisingyourmind.com and learn more from there. I'll actually put this into the... The title here, Exercising Exercising Your Mind.com. That's where everybody should go. And that is going to be the main place where from now on, I think I'll start putting these future episodes on there. All right. Right now before me, I have several books. One of them, so the first ones I'll be drawing from are, uh, one is called How Money Works, The Fact Visually Explained. And the other one is The Little Book of Economics. They are both compilations by several different contributors and so in this first pilot here i'm going to um, give a little bit of those credits so let's see we have uh, some of the well the first american edition wow 2017 uh, let's see, we have UK, I'm going to go through the editors. So we have the UK editors, Alison Sturgeon, Ali Collins, Diane uh, Pengali, Georgina uh, Palfi, Jemima Dunn, and Tosh Khan. US editors, Christy Luciak, Margaret Parrish, and um, we have a managing editor, editor, Gareth Jones, and senior managing art editor, I don't know if that's going to matter, is Lee Griffiths, the publisher, Liz Wheeler. That's all I'm going to give for those different things right there. Um, this is from the book, How Money Works. On the front cover, has some interesting factoids that I'll start with. 7% is the average annual stock market return since World War II. Banknotes have existed since 1661, and crowdfunding has been around since the 1700s. Didn't know that one. 10% of the world, oh, this, is, this is a little upsetting, 10% of the world lives on less than a dollar and 90 cents a day. 2.5 billion adults don't have a bank account. That's not surprising. The first old age pension was introduced in around 1891. At 3.75 tons, the rye stone, that's spelled R-A-I, is the world's heaviest currency. Can you imagine some money that's uh, 2.5? 3.75 tons. There are 180 currencies in use around the world. 180 currencies in use around the world. Fascinating. 92% of global currency is digital. That was a new one for me today as well. 92% of global currency is digital. Now this book is How Money Works, The Facts visu Visually Explained. At that time that this was published is the first American 
edition was 2017. That's what it looks like. So can you imagine 2017, they're saying that 92% of global currency is digital. All right. Next little fact to it. This is off on the front cover. What's up, Chuck K. Jeter and uh, author Nicole S. Brown? The 107 billion euros of Greek debt was written off in 2012. I didn't know it was that much, but I knew that something happened over there. The global GDP, that's gross domestic product, has more than doubled since 1970. The global, well, why, why, how, is, how does domestic fit in with global? Global GDP, all right. I guess maybe they're counting all of the different domestic, gross domestic products from each country, putting it together. And uh, ooh, this is a nice one. $21 trillion is thought to be hidden in overseas tax haven. $21 trillion is thought to be hidden in overseas tax havens. My tiny part of that. How many works? How many works? Let's look at the introduction here, folks. This is going to be a continued series that I'm going to be focusing on for a long time. You can see uh, Wealth Attraction Research. I did not know that that WAR was the acronym for that when I did it, even though I'm an acronym person when I first started it years ago. But the website, uh, Wealth Attraction Research, it's exercisingyourmind.com, has been online since 2007. That is 16 years. And um, it's Wealth Attraction Research. Great health is the truest of all wealth. And there are a lot of articles on there about staying healthy while building a business or as an entrepreneur or in several other ways, taking care of friends and families and things like that, as well as some things that uh, talk about uh, managing money and things like that. But these, this moving forward as I've become completely obsessed with this subject because it's more fascinating than I ever thought it was. It's actually... Um, it's it's uh, I found connections between what some people might call magic and alchemy, and it actually came to be to be a realization when I was living in China and I had an experience, a thought in my mind that I didn't know exactly what it was until I was back in the United States on an app called Breakout. And someone who worked for the World Bank actually told me that something I was describing to them was called economic physics economic physics, and it had to do with me carrying around um, at a minimum a thousand Chinese yuan at a time in the form of their red 100 yuan uh, bills every day and how it had affected me psychologically and behaviorally. But I'm going to move on to, and I'll be flipping back and forth through a lot of different books and research as I go along, and I'll do my best to keep you up to what I'm drawing from. There's a lot of it. Right now, I have uh, how many works. It's various different contributors. It's actually um, it's more like a, a college textbook, but very visually explained than anything else. How many works, the facts visually explained. And then the little book of economics, um, which also has uh, lots of visual stuff and lots of contributors. So both of these books are various contributors it's not one author so these are really amazing i like the way that these are put together um i also have a book that's mentioned um in at least one of these which is the wealth of nations by adam smith um which i'll also be referencing from time to time because folks this is some fascinating stuff all right the introduction from um, how many works the facts visually explain. Introduction. Money is the oil that keeps the machinery of our world turning. By giving goods and services an easy, easily measured value, money facilitates the billions of transactions that take place every day. Without it, the industry and trade 
that form the basis of modern economies would grind to a halt and the flow of wealth around the world would cease. Key words here, everybody. Take this down. Flow and wealth. Wealth flow, cash flow. Key words to start remembering. If you're going to write stuff down, yo, some magic is about to happen. This is really amazing. The things that have been going on with me lately and what's going on here. This this has to be done. This has to be documented. This is incredible. Um, it's as the series goes on, this is you're going to get tired of it or you're going to become completely fascinated with it as I am, because this is pretty much all I'm going to be talking about from now on because of some of the things that I've seen happen. It's only these things are explaining to me what I've been doing and what's been going on sometimes without knowing it a lot of it has been completely subconscious or even unconscious continuing money has fulfilled this vital role for thousands of years before its invention people bartered swapping goods they produced themselves for things they needed from others barter is sufficient for simple transactions but not when the things traded are of different values or not available at the same time. Money, by contrast, is a recognized uniform or has a, so money, by contrast, has a recognized uniform value and is widely accepted. At heart, a simple concept. Over many thousands of years, it has become very complex indeed. At the start of the modern age, Individuals and governments began to establish banks and other financial, financial institutions were formed. Eventually, ordinary people could deposit their money in a bank account and earn interest, borrow money and buy property, invest their wages in businesses, or start companies themselves. I'm going to refer back to something on the cover. If you guys know this, I'm going to repeat this again. 2.5 billion adults don't have a bank account. 2.5 billion adults don't have a bank account, and 10% of the world lives on less than $1.90 a day. This is fucked up. All right, well, the, the second thing that I said, I don't care that people, 2.5 billion adults don't have a bank account. I mean, unless it bothers them, then that sucks. But that's the number's probably greater than that. But 10% of the world lives on less than $1.90 a day. You know, I'm pretty sure I, I saw that when I lived in China. Because my income was five times higher than the average at uh, 30,000 UN per month, whereas most people were making 6,000 to 7,000 UN per month. So, yeah, pretty ridiculous the amount of money, the difference. Um, but, I, but people were doing it. They, had, they were just managing their money like the most amazing way that I've seen by, I mean, had their own places, you know. Uh, paying their bills, uh, going out to eat. It's, it, was, it was pretty incredible to see. Continuing. Um, banks could also insure against the sorts of calamities that might devastate families or traders, encouraging risk in the pursuit of profit. There's a second thing right there. Risk in the, per risk in the pursuit of profit. So we have Wealth flow and cash flow as two um, words that or statements that need to be recalled. So I'm going to put this wealth flow. There are things that are are sticking out to me that I feel like are very important. Wealth flow and cash flow, and encouraging risk in the pursuit of profit. These things are very important. They're 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 popping out to me because they're describing things that I've done, encouraging and that I focused on, encouraging risk in the pursuit of profit. Risk in the I don't even like the word pursuit there because I don't pursue anything. Encouraging risk in the pursuit of profit, but that's what it says here in the book. I'm gonna change it uh, up here. Let's see. Let's vote on a, a term here. Because we shouldn't pursue a lot of things, you know, like unless somebody, you know, swipes something from you, you have to chase them down and kick them in the leg to drop them on their butt and then take your property back. I don't encourage pursuing very much of 
of anything, at least not in a desperate way, right? Desperation drives a lot of things away. Encouraging risk in the, let's say attraction, right? A lot of people like that word. Encouraging risk, we can say for the, in the or for, right, the attraction of profit. But it says pursuit, so you can use that term if you want. All right, encouraging risk in the pursuit or the attraction of profit. i got to start using this other pen. Okay. Um, there is a term that I've been using for a long time, and I love acronyms, and it's CAMP. C-A-M-P, which is Create, Archive, Market, and Publish. It's something that I've been using and building a lot of multimedia um, offerings. Continuing. So today, it is a nation's government and central bank that control a country's economy. The Federal Reserve, known as the Fed, is the central bank in the U.S. The Fed issues currency determines how much of it is in circulation and decides how much interest it will charge banks to borrow its money. While governments still print and guarantee money, in today's world, it no longer needs to exist as physical coins or notes, but can be found solely in digital form. I'm going to grab my little pocket uh, constitution here and just point out something to everyone that also should be known. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, right, the central bank in the U.S., one, people jokingly say that the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express, right, because it's not an actual government organization. It works with government. Um, but the Federal Reserve was actually founded in 1913. Interestingly enough, the 16th Amendment, Amendment 16, right, was ratified on February 3rd. 1913. Very interesting that um, the Federal Reserve and the 16th Amendment were both uh, uh, ratified and established in 1913. What is the 16th Amendment, you may ask? It says, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Please look that up for yourself, the 16th Amendment, ratified on February 3rd, 1913, the same year that the Federal Reserve Bank was established in the United States about taxes. And another note on taxes, I'm gonna keep saying this over and over again, but uh, did you know that 95.5 I'm sorry, 99.5% of the U.S. tax code is written to legally avoid paying taxes. To legally avoid paying taxes, 99.5% of the U.S. tax code is written for you to legally avoid paying taxes. Even as an individual who doesn't own businesses, there are tax breaks, so-called, for you, and more so for people who are business owners and investors, which is a simple process to get into but by no means easy for everybody to do. And not everybody wants the same thing anyway. And only half a percent is allotted of the U.S. tax code to collecting taxes from the people. So that's an interesting factoid there. Uh, moving on. Let's see. This book examines every aspect of how money works, including its history, financial markets and institutions, government finance, profit making, personal finance, wealth, shares, pensions, social security benefits, and national and local taxes. Through visual explanations and practical examples that make even the most complex concept immediately accessible, How Many Works offers a clear understanding of what money is all about and how it shapes the modern economy. Continuing in the same book, Money Basics, The Evolution of Money. People originally traded surplus commodities with each other. Okay, what does that mean, surplus commodities? That means when somebody had some extra of something that they didn't need, right? Like they had extra fish or extra cows that they or their family could not use, 
right? So the cows, the fish, those are commodities, right? They originally traded surplus, that means extra, right? Commodities. Look, and I'm not, I have to talk to people with all of these explanations because what the hell's going on here? Um, wise words to live right. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Uh, somebody just sent me that message thinking of me. Whatever, I'm not sad about anything except I'm sad about everything. So I don't know what that's about. You know, like the Incredible Hulk? I said, that's my secret. I'm always angry. Well, I'm always melancholy and forlorn. So it's kind of normal for me. I don't know what that message is about. Continuing back the evolution of money, people originally traded surplus commodities with each other in a process known as bartering. The value of each good traded could be debated, however, and money evolved as a practical solution to the complexities of bartering hundreds of different things. Over the centuries, money has appeared in many forms, but whatever shape it take, whether as a coin, a note, or stored on a digital server, money always provides a fixed value against which any item can be compared. That's an important note there. Money always provides a fixed value against which any item can be compared. That's the important note about that one. So I'm going to pause for this. Money always provides a fixed value. Right? That's interesting, very important to understand about money. This, this is very important in alchemy and magic, if you will, and the law of attraction. This is the deeper part of it, the stuff that everybody shies away from. Money always provides a fixed value. Money always provides a fixed value against which any item can be compared. Any item can be compared. What time is it? 18.52 and on for about 32 minutes. All right. Well, no, 22 minutes. All right. The ascent of money. Money has become increasingly complex over time. What began as a means of recording trade exchanges then appeared in the form of coins and notes. It is now primarily digital. It's now primarily digital. From about 10,000 to 3,000 BC, barter in early forms of trading, specific items were exchanged for others agreed by the negotiating parties to be of similar value. Around 7,000 7, BC, there were evidence of trade records. Pictures of items were used to record trade exchanges, becoming more complex as values were established and documented. Coinage, around 600 BCE to 1100 CE, that's, they're using the terms BC, the abbreviations BCE, which is before Common Era, and CE Common Era, if you don't know. Um, coinage defined weights of precious metals used by some merchants were later formalized as coins that were usually issued by states. Banknotes from around 1100 to 2000. States began to use banknotes issuing paper IOUs that were traded as currency and could be exchanged for coins at any time. So the coins were most important. This is something very interesting and very important to know. The US dollar used to be known as silver certificates because they had silver and gold backing them before, right? Um, uh, digital money, 2000 onward. Money can now exist virtually on computers and large transactions can take place without any physical cash changing hands. Um, 
I, I don't know about this number, but it says 80.9 trillion is the estimated amount of money in existence today. I think that number is wrong. 80.9 trillion. All right. That's that's my opinion. Okay. Supply and demand. The economic law of supply and demand states that when the price of a commodity such as oil falls, consumers tend to use or demand more of it. And when its price rises, the demand increases. One of the key factors affecting price is the amount of a commodity available, its supply. Low supply will push prices up as consumers are willing to pay more for something that is difficult to obtain and high supply will push prices down as consumers will not pay a premium for something that is plentiful. Sips T. All right, macro versus microeconomics. Macroeconomics studies the impact of changes in the economy as a whole. Microeconomics examines the behavior of smaller groups. Macroeconomics, this measures change in indicators that affect the whole economy. The money supply, the amount of money circulating in an economy, unemployment, the number of people who cannot find work, inflation, the amount by which prices rise each year. Microeconomics, this examines the effects that decisions of firms and individuals have on the economy. Some of this folks, when it, people to blame, right? You wanna point fingers at somewhere? This is the, in this, the study of microeconomics. This examines the effects that decisions of firms and individuals have on the economy. It also covers industrial organization, the impact of monopolies and cartels on the economy, right? Which that is just a subdivision, right? Of that, because we talked about the decisions of firms and individuals. So industrial organization, the impact of monopolies and cartels on the economy. And wages, the impact that salary levels which are affected by labor and production costs have on consumer spending, right? So you wonder why when people are talking about uh, raising the, the minimum wage, um, why that makes uh, costs go up, right? Well, that's because this is the impact that salary levels, which are affected by labor and production costs have on consumer spending. Hey, uh, welcome everybody to the room. Hello, I think author Nicholas Brown for coming through or bouncing through. Kay Jeter, Amos Waterbury, hello. Nancy Diatoro, Sarita, what's up? Sarah, Sarita Bot, Ter Taryn Thompson, Wandering Fool is here, what's up, yo? Mary Kay, Doobie Doobie Doo, what's up? Chuck, Dr. Rao, Lindsay Mae McKay, and hey, Dio Akinrenade has came through or passed through the room. So hello everybody, as I continue. Um, remember, uh, I've got a couple of different books here. They all have green on them. Everybody, you know, it's like the like the as if the American dollar. Um, one thing everybody should know is the BRICS summit coming up or a meeting is coming up in uh, August 22nd of this year, 2023. Um, that is one day before my beloved Floor Elizabeth Carrasco's birthday. How I miss her so much. Um, August 22nd this year is the a BRICS meeting, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and also South Africa now, Saudi Arabia, and about 30 to 40 other countries are going to be involved. And one of the rumors that was going around is that they may be deciding to to stop trading in the American dollar and and issue a new currency that is actually backed by gold. So. That should be interesting what happens there, although they've said publicly that they're not doing that. Other people have predicted um, that that may happen. One of them particularly that I follow a lot is Robert T. Kiyosaki. Say what you will about the man, but uh, he's got some interesting stuff. So <clears throat> this is how money works. The facts visually explain. I'm also going to be drawing from the little book of economics. Um, I think both books. Uh, this one, actually, the little book of economics was 
first 2012 and then 2020 was the second publishing by uh, a division of Penguin Random House LLC, Darling Kinsley Limited, right, whatever. That's DK, and then this one was published in 2017. Oh, also by DK, awesome. DK has a lot of books on money. I didn't even realize that when I first bought them. All right, moving on. Barter, IOUs, and money. Barter, the direct exchange of goods, formed the basis of trade for thousands of years. Oh, this is where I saw that reference to it, because the other book I'll be using is A Wealth of Nations. It says, Adam Smith, 18th century author of Wealth of Nations, was one of the first to identify it as a precursor to money. Interesting. Adam Smith, 18th century author of the Wealth of Nations, was one of the first to identify it, bartering, as a precursor to money. Barter in practice. Essentially, barter involves the exchange of an item, such as a cow, for one or more of a perceived equal value. For example, a load of wheat. For the most part, the two parties bring the goods with them and hand them over at the time of a transaction. Sometimes, one of the parties will accept an IOU, or even a token, that is agreed can be exchanged for the same goods or something else at a later date. What are the pros and cons of barter? Pros. Trading relationships fosters strong links between parter, partners. Physical goods are exchanged. Barter does not rely on trust that money will retain its value. This is going to be an important thing, too, later also. Trust. Money, actually, a big part of it is based on trust. What are the cons of barter? Market needed. Both parties must want what the other offers. Hard to establish a set value on items. Two goats may have a certain value to one party one day, but less a week later. Goods may not be easily divisible. For example, a living animal cannot be divided. Well, well, not living. And a large-scale transactions can be difficult. Transporting one goat is easy. Moving 1,000 is not. So direct trade, right? Simple exchange. One party directly swaps in its item, a cow, for the other party, party's goods, which could be wheat, right? Trading with IOUs, though, right? You can go like this. Summer wheat is delivered in an exchange for an IOU for a cow, right? And then when the winter comes, the once the cow is fully grown, it is handed over to fulfill the IOU. How it works, in the simplest form, two parties to barter to a barter transaction agree on a price, such as a cow for wheat, and physically hand over the goods at the agreed time. However, this may not always be possible. For example, the wheat might not be ready to harvest, so one party may accept an IOU to be exchanged later for the physical goods. Eventually, these IOUs acquire their own value, and the IOU holder could exchange them for something else of the same value as the original commodity, perhaps apples instead of wheat. The IOUs are now performing the same function as actual money. So you got bartering IOUs money. There's a link right there, right? Bartering IOUs money, putting this together. And of course, you can have an IOU for clothes, for wheat, for firewood, for apples, for a cow, or even for fence building. Trading in IOUs, they can be exchanged between different parties for a variety of items, not necessarily the one first agreed on. Here's another definition right here of money. We have money, a universal IOU that has an agreed value in terms of the goods it can be exchanged for. Important definition. Money is a universal IOU. Come on, pen, right. Money is a universal IOU that has an agreed value that has an agreed value in terms in terms of the goods it can be exchanged for. All right, so what's money is a universal IOU that has an agreed value 
in terms of the goods it can be exchanged for. Who here has already known what the definition of money is that way? Huh? All right. So, continuing on. Oh, Mary Kay, I want to acknowledge that I see you in the caller's queue, but I'm not taking any um, calls at this time because I, I get really distracted and it's already, I'm already as dist distractible as it is and I need to focus on this right now because I have an agenda for this. But thank you for calling in. We'll talk later. Um, all right, so that was the money is a universal IU that has an agreed value in terms of the goods it can be exchanged for. Artifacts of money. Let me see. I'm going to cut out of here soon. Uh, yeah, because uh, I'm going to finish this section, artifacts of money, and I'm going to stop there, and then I'll maybe bounce around a little bit. Let's see how much time I have. Probably about only 25 more minutes before I stop this and then start again because I want to keep everything to about an hour um, at a time so that I can see how these upload to my um, podcasting account speaker because there's issues when they're a little bit longer. So continuing, artifacts of money. Since the early attempts at getting at setting values for bartered goods, money has come in many forms from IOUs to tokens. Cows, shells, and precious metals have all been used. How it works. Bartering was a very immediate form of transaction. Once writing was invented, records could be kept detailing the value of goods traded as well as of the IOUs. Eventually, tokens such as beads, colored cowrie shells, or lumps of gold were assigned a specific value, which meant that they could be exchanged directly for goods. It was a small step from this to making tokens explicitly to represent value in the form of metal disks. The first coins in Lydia, I had a girlfriend in Lydia, Asia Minor from around 650 BCE. Now the first coins in Lydia, Asia Minor from around, let me see. It was a small step from this to making coins explicitly to represent the value in the form of metal disc. The first coins in Lydia, Asia Minor from around 650 BCE. For more than 2,000 years, coins made from precious metals such as gold, silver, and for small transactions, copper formed the main medium of monetary exchange. Ooh, the characteristics of money. This is an important part here. Money is not money unless it has all of the following defining characteristics. Money must have value, be durable, Portable, uniform, divisible, in limited supply, and be usable as a means of exchange. I remember earlier I mentioned trust. It says, continuing, underlying all of these characteristics is trust. People must be confident that if they accept money, they can use it to pay for goods. People must be confident that if they accept money, they can use it to pay for goods. That's the trust. Let's take a look here. Let's go back to a timeline. 5000 BCE barter. Early trade involved directly exchanged, exchanged items, often perishable ones, such as a cow. 4000 BCE. Sumerian cuneiform tablets. Scribes recorded transactions on clay tablets, which could also act as receipts. 1000 BCE, cowrie shells used as currency across India and the South Pacific. They appeared in many colors and sizes. 600 BCE, Lydian gold coins. In Lydia, a mixture of gold and silver was formed into disks or coins stamped with inscriptions. Also in 600 BCE, the Athenian drachma, 
the Athenians used silver from Laurion to mint a currency used right across the Greek world. 200 BCE, the Han Dynasty coin, often made of bronze or copper, early Chinese coins had holes punched in their center, well, a hole in the shape of a square. 27 BCE, before Common Era, the Roman coin bearing the head of the emperor, these coins so circulated throughout the Roman Empire. 700 Common Era, Byzantine coin. Early Byzantine coins were pure gold. Later ones also contained metals such as copper. 900 Common Era, Anglo-Saxon coin. This 10th century silver penny has an inscription stating that Offa is king, Rex of Mercia. Offa Rex Mercia. And the, in 900 Common Era, the Arabic Durham. Many silver coins from the Islamic Empire were carried to Scandinavia by Vikings. All right, item of worth. Most money originally had an intrinsic value, such as that of the precious metals that was used to make the coin. This in itself acted as some guarantee the coin would be accepted. Store of value. Money acts as a means by which people can store their wealth for future use. It must not, therefore, be perishable, and it helps if it, if it is of a practical size that can be stored and transported easily. Means of exchange. It must be possible to exchange money freely and widely for goods, and its value should be as stable as possible. It helps if that value is easily divisible and if there are sufficient denominations so change can be given. Unit of account. Money can also be used to record wealth possessed, traded, or spent personally and nationally. It helps if only one recognized authority issues money. If anybody could issue it, then trust in its value would disappear, right? The problem with counterfeiting, right? So if anybody could issue it, then trust in its value would disappear. Well, we have the one main place that's issuing money and trust in its value is disappearing for some people. But there's no cause for doom and gloom. Not in this room, not in this room. Ooh, what is this? George Simmel and the Philosophy of Money. Published in 1900, German sociologist George Simmel's book, The Philosophy of Money, looked at the meaning of value in relation to money. Stimmel observed that in pre-modern societies, people made objects, but the value they attached to each of them was difficult to fix as it was assessed by incompatible systems based on honor, time, and labor. Money made it easier to assign consistent values to object, objects, which Simmel believed made interactions between people more rational as it freed them from personal ties and provided greater freedom of choice. That's, that's a good philosophy of money right there, right? It made it more consistent to assign consistent values, which made interactions between people more rational because it freed them from personal ties and provided greater freedom of choice, right? Because you could, you could trade it for different things. Like remember the old IOUs were traded, hey, I got this wheat, but your cow's not full grown yet. Here's an, uh, here's an, uh, the person with the cow, the, the little calf says, here's an IOU that in the winter time, this cow will be fully grown and ready to give it to you. So here's an IOU for that. So you can come back later and remind you and remind me that I owe you this cow. All right. So ooh, we're still in the section economics of money. And I'll finish this off here. Um, have about 15 minutes left. The economics of money. From the 16th century, understanding of the nature of money became more sophisticated. 
economics as a discipline emerged in part to help explain the inflation caused in Europe by the large scale importation of silver from the newly discovered Americas. Ah, interesting. That inflation in Europe was caused by the large scale importation of silver from the newly discovered Americas. Interesting. Uh, national banks were established in the late 17th century with the duty of regulating a country's money supplies. By the early 20th century, money became separated from its direct relationship to precious metal. Hmm. Yes, indeed. We're on to something. By the early 20th century, money became separated from its direct relationship to precious metal. The gold standard collapsed altogether in the 1930s. By the mid 20th century, a new way of trading with money appeared, such as credit cards, digital transactions, and even forms of money such as cryptocurrencies and, oh, these are the most evil of all, financial derivatives. As a result, the amount of money in existence and in circulation increased enormously. Increased enormously. Let's take a look at some of these things. We've got a boat sailing in, gold and silver from the New World, right? That's the Americas. From 1540 to 1640, Potosi inflation. The Spanish discovered silver in Potosi, Bolivia, and caused a century of inflation by shipping 350 tons of the metal back to Europe annually. Silver, 350 tons every year of silver went back to Europe and caused inflation from Batosa, Bolivia. Crazy. Ooh. From 1542 to 1551, this I actually read about debasement in Robert Kiyosaki's book, The Capitalist Manifesto. Debasement, which I, I never thought about it before, but I mean, I knew about it, just never really thought about it. So they put it in such a clear form. The 1542 to 1551, The Great Debasement, England's Henry VIII, Henry VIII, I am, I am, Henry VIII, I am, right? England's Henry VIII debased the silver penny, making it three quarters copper. Inflation increased as trust dropped. Dropped? Increase, inflation increased as trust dropped. So see, trust can also cause inflation. There's a connection here. Trust and inflation and also increase of a certain resource like silver into the economy hmm. all right in 1553 uh, joint stock company early joint stock companies merchants guys this is 500 years ago almost well 450 447 years ago 1553 joint early joint stock companies merchants in england began to form companies in which investors bought shares, stock, and shared its rewards. In 1553, in 1694, the Bank of England, the Bank of England was created as a body that could raise funds at a low interest rate and manage national debt. 1694, guys, ladies, gentlemen, you. You all, this goes way back in history. Did you, did you know that uh, that stocks were created back in the 1500s? 1970, rate inflation. In the U.S., inflation accelerated quickly. Wait a minute, hold on. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. This thing has a little line going from right, left to right, and then curves down and goes right to left and curves back again. Let me. Let's go back to the Bank of England. My Bank of England was created as a body that could raise funds at low interest rate, at a low interest rate, and manage national debt. Then next, it goes to 1696, which two years after the Bank of England is the Royal Mint. What? Isaac Newton became warden and argued that debasing undermined confidence. All coins were recalled 
and new silver ones were minted. Way to go, Isaac Newton. Not just uh, responsible for the three laws of motion, eh? Also for arguing that uh, debasing undermined confidence, right? Un what is undermining confidence? Also undermining trust. Remember, trust is one of the things, right? One, underlying all of the characteristics of money having value, being durable, portable, uniform, divisible, and in limited supply and be usable as, as a means of exchange is trust. People must be confident that if they accept money, they can use it to pay for goods. So Isaac Newton argues that debasing, that is mixing like what uh, England's Henry VIII debased the silver penny, making it three quarters copper, right? Inflation increased as trust dropped. So Isaac Newton argued against that. He argued that debasing undermined confidence, which it did, right? Uh, we know that from 100 years, a little more than 100 years uh, earlier. So continuing, 1775, the U.S. dollar, the Continental Congress. This is so interesting, this stuff that's happening. Um, 1773 was the Boston Tea Party where they revolted against taxes, and then later the Revolutionary War happened. And then 1776 was the founding of the United States, right? The Declaration of Independence, is that right? Um, yeah, chronology, let's see, I have the, let's see, introduction, I'm looking at my, my pocket constitution of the United States of America. The sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity itself and can never be erased. Alexander Hamilton, The Farmer Refuted, 1775. Mm -hmm. The Declaration of Independence. Yeah, beginning in 1776, Americans launched a series of experiments in state constitution making. The fruits of those experiments guided later efforts in devising and amending constitutions. All right, so anyway, um, let's go back to the uh, how money works. 1775, U.S. dollar. The Continental Congress authorized the issue of United States dollars in 1775, but the first national currency was not minted by the U.S. Treasury until 1794. The Continental Congress authorized the issue of the United States dollars in 1775, but the first national currency was not minted by the U.S. Treasury until 1794. Moving on, about uh, from 1844, the gold standard. The British pound was tied to a defined equivalent amount of gold. Other countries adopted a similar gold standard. You know, that reminds me of in physics, right? That there's a fixed weights and measures where you have, for example, a second is measured as um, the amount of time it takes for like a decay of something. I forget, how, how is the, let me check, look this up. Forgive me for geeking out. Uh, that's my text message saying, just reminded that you have scheduled for a heat map session on August 10th, 2023. Yes, thank you very much, I know that. <clears throat> now with Uber, me being there, uh, the state of Virginia's um, crew member. All right. What is, uh, let me ask Google. How was the second measured? The second is defined by taking the fixed numerical value of the cesium frequency, All right? Which is here represented by delta V. The unperturbed ground state hyperfine transition frequency of the cesium-133 atom to be 9,192,671,770 when expressed in the unit hertz, which is equal to second minus, what is that symbol? Second minus one, the wording of this definition was updated in 2019. Good Lord, they're still redefining the definition of a second. All right, well, cesium-133, which is interesting because I was just reading about that in the book that I have right before me called Radiation. So let me not get too off track. What is, um, I told you, I was uh, distractible. Um, 
uh, Mary Kay. That's why I can't take any calls because I'm just I'm uh, I lose it. I'm already I got like 50 books in front of me. I'll lose my mind. Um, all right. So yeah. So the British pound was tied to a different to a to a defined equivalent amount of gold. Other countries similarly adopt similar adopted a gold standard. That's 1844. In 1970, the Great Inflation, the U.S. inflation accelerated. Wow, that's a big jump from 1844 to 1970. The 1970 Great Inflation, the U.S. in the U.S. inflation accelerated quickly. The stock market plummeted 40% in an 18-month period. Five more minutes. I'm cutting out and I'm coming back with some stuff from another book. Um, in the 19, 1970s, credit cards. 1970s. The creation of credit cards enabled consumers to access short term credit to make smaller purchases. This resulted in the growth of personal debt. Ooh, 1970. That's my decade. Ooh, ooh, 1977. All right. In 1990s, digital money, the easy transfer of funds and convenience of electronic payments became increasingly popular as internet use increased. In 1999, the euro. 12 European Union countries joined together and replaced their national currencies with the euro. Banknotes and coins were issued three years later, so in 2002. They finally started issuing that after the currencies were transferred over to the replace with the national currencies with the euro. Everybody traded in the euro. 2008, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, a form of electronic money that exists solely as encrypted data on servers, is announced. The first transaction took place in January of 2009. All right, that's enough for that right now. You've been listening to Wealth Attraction Research, WAR, War, the pilot, here on Wisdom Social Audio, Inc. Hopefully getting it over onto Spreaker, social podcasting, and just a few here. Coming up next, I'm going to continue. And uh, I was reading from and commenting on the book called How Money Works, The Facts Visually Explained. Um, with various contributors. And next I'll be going into a little book of economics. Um, and it's good because playing off of this last section here, or the next section coming up in the book, the, the How Money Works book, is the emergence of modern economics. And also mentioning Adam Smith, which I also have a copy of that book, The Wealth of Nations. Lots of stuff going on here. Um, and closing out with these little factoids from the beginning of book, once again, as I shut it down. 7% is the average annual stock market return since World War II. Banknotes have existed since 1661, and crowdfunding has been around since the 1700s. 10% of the world lives on less than $1.90 a day. 2.5 billion adults don't have a bank account. The first old age pension was introduced in 1891. At 3.75 tons, the RAI or RAI stone is the world's heaviest currency. There are 180 currencies in use around the world. 92% of global currency is digital. 107 billion euros of Greek debt was written off in 2012. The global GDP has more than doubled since 1970. And 21 trillion is thought to be, 21 trillion dollars is thought to be hidden in overseas tax havens. Wow. All right, you've been listening to Wealth Attraction Research presented by Hakeem Ali Bokas Alexander here on Wisdom Social Audio Inc. and Spreaker Social Podcasting presented for World Reading Club in association with exercisingyourmind.com.